of God. But God. turn our attention uh, to verse 11 to verse 12 verse 10 11 and 12 verse 10 says and I said this is my infirmity but I will remember the years of thy right hand of the most high verse 11 I will remember the works of the Lord Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. Verse 12, I will meditate also of all thy works and talk of thy doing. If you will help me preach tonight, I want to talk from the subject, amen. Excuse me, I just complained. That's what I want to talk about tonight. Excuse me. I just complained. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, excuse me. I just complained. When we look at the text tonight by the psalmist, I'm sure that we all can find ourselves in the midst of these verses. I know we don't like to admit it, but the truth be told, we are all guilty of complaining along the way. Matter of fact, if some of us was honest tonight, some of us did some complaining before we left the house on our way to church tonight. Some of us did some complaining in the pews while you were sitting waiting for worship to start. As I read this text, the first thing, uh, Sister Wanda, that came to my mind was a song that has been very popular over the past 20 plus years. One of my favorite songs is entitled, I Won't Complain. It is the Reverend Paul Jones from 1960 to 1990 who is oftentimes credited with the writing that songs, song. However, Bishop William C. Abney actually wrote the song, although it's most remembered uh, by the late now Reverend Clay Evans' rendition. The song says, I had some good days. I've had some hills to climb. I've had some weary days. I've had some lonely nights. But when I look around and I think things over, all of my good days, they outweigh my bad days, so I won't complain. The song goes on to say, sometimes clouds hang low. I can hardly see the road. I ask the question, Lord, why so much pain? But the Lord knows what's best for me, although my weary eyes cannot see. So I'll just say, thank you, Lord. I won't complain. But here's what I've learned, that we love to sing the song. We wreck the church and we fall out all over the floor when the song is sung under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But the bottom line is the fact that majority of, to us is a great song, but in reality, we really do complain. Even in our text tonight, the writer, he fully admits to complaining. He does not try to hide behind a song. He does not try to fool God. He simply admits and says, I've complained. Uh, this particular psalm was written by a Jew who lived during the time of exile. Those were difficult times for the people of Israel. They were scattered away from their homeland. And as he looked at his nation, the psalmist could not see any hope of an end to the hardship his people were going through. We can feel his agony in this chapter. He was pouring his heart out to God. Uh, he was sad. He was tired. He was depressed. In such a situation, there are many questions, unanswered questions. Uh, and he found himself pouring out these questions to God. He asks, will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has his anger withheld, has he in anger withheld his compassion? I want to know tonight, have you ever had some moments like that? Where you felt like God had abandoned you? Where God has turned his back on you and you begin to wonder, has God forgotten the promises that he has made in his word? Is he not a concern with what I'm going through down here? 
And there are honest questions being presented in this text for our consideration. A man who is trying to understand the meaning of what he is going through. And these are questions we ask too. Uh, they force out of our hearts when we go through hardships and pains of this life. As God really casts him and his people out forever. And we find here in the text that the writer finds himself in a dry place, a spiritual wilderness. He felt as though emptiness has taken his soul. Asaph, who wrote this psalm, penned the words while in a spiritual wilderness. Uh, you didn't know who Asaph was. Asaph was a worship leader for Israel. He was a famous and skilled musician. King David had appointed him chief of the Levites who provided music at the ceremony held when the Ark of the Covenant was brought back to Jerusalem. He wrote 11 of the Psalms recorded in the Bible and was instrumental in many ways. And this praise and worship leader is the same one who cries to God and says, I am so troubled that I cannot speak. Here is the question we ought to ask ourselves is what happens when the worship leader is in a dry place? What, what happens when the person that is responsible for ushering God's people to a higher point in praise, what happens when the leader finds themselves in a wilderness situation? Please understand tonight there is a difference between a desert and a wilderness. Please understand desert is caused by sin and therefore there is a need for repentance. Wilderness is a place of growth. Therefore, there is a need for trusting in God. And the question is how we respond in each situation is critical to our spiritual growth. I said it before and I say it again. It is essential as you're going through the wilderness of life that you continue to trust God in the midst of your wilderness. It is essential that you continue to praise God. You continue to worship him. You continue to acknowledge that he is still God in the midst of your wilderness. That we need to realize that the wilderness experiences are a part of our everyday life. And sooner or later you will find yourself in such an experience. If you find a Christian that says they never experienced the wilderness in their Christian walk, they never experienced a spiritual dry time. And here it is, here it is. If you haven't been through a wilderness yet, somebody look at your neighbor and say, just keep on living because a wilderness is soon to happen in your life. Uh, and here it is. You must understand that the most likely, uh, uh, if those say they've never been through a wilderness, they have not been a Christian very long. And here it is, you got to watch out for folks that's always acting like they're up all the time. You ought you to watch out every now for folks that are always coming in uh, acting like everything is holly duty every time. There's times in your life that you're going to come in and you don't feel like worshiping. There's times in your life that you're going to get up and you don't feel like coming to church. Uh, but those that are connected to the divine power of the Holy Spirit, they understand where they help come from. I need to talk to about 10 people in the building that says, every time I put Push past how I feel. God always meet me at the point of my needs. Uh, there have been times that I didn't feel like worshiping, uh, but I've learned when I lift my hands and open my mouth, uh, then God met me at the point of my need. Uh, is there anybody here on a Wednesday night uh, that says, look, my turkey was cooking in the oven. I really didn't feel like coming out to church. You can be honest and transparent, but because I pressed with my way on tonight and privileged my way, uh, I understand that there is a blessing in the press. Uh, and that's why you must understand you have to look at your wilderness through a different lens and scope. Uh, I said it before and I say it again. Come here, David. David even had to attest to the fact that although he had a walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he understood that the Lord was right there with him. Uh, I need to pause there and speak to somebody tonight that know without a shadow of doubt that it was the Lord that was walking with you. Uh, who am I talking to tonight that ever been in some trouble? Your back was up against the wall. You didn't know how you were going to get out of it, but you remember that the Lord was walking with you. Uh, is there anybody that ever been?
have been down to your last dime, didn't know where your next meal was going to come from, but all of a sudden God showed up in the midst of it, and you didn't take any credit for what has happened, but you said the Lord was with me. I need to talk to some Holy Ghost field folks on tonight that says I didn't get to where I am on my own, but I got to where I am with the understanding that the Lord was with me. And I realized if the Lord ever leaves me, then I wouldn't be where I am. If the Lord ever takes his hand off of me, I wouldn't know where to go. If the Lord ever removes his spirit from me, I would lose my direction. Is there anybody in the building that got the Holy Ghost on tonight that says, I thank God that he's been with me. He's been with me in my tears. He's been with me in my good times. He's been with me when I was about to lose my mind in the midst of what I was going through. He was right there when I was crying on my pillow, uh, wrapping his loving arms around me uh, and let me know that weeping may adore for a night, but joy will come in the morning. I thank God that even when I can't see him and even when I can't feel him, he is still right there with me. I need to talk to somebody here that almost gave up, but the reason you still held on is because you got the testimony that in the midst of it all, the Lord was with me. Lord, somebody say, he's with me, he's with me, he's with me. Matter of fact, he's with me right now. I can feel him all over me. Every now and then he gets in my hands and I can't contain myself. He gets in my feet and I got to shout. He gets in my mouth and I got to open my mouth and thank him because when I think of his goodness and what he's done for me, I have the testimony that the Lord is with he is with me. He, he, he walks with us through our wilderness experiences. Please understand it is a part of our everyday life. When you even look throughout scripture, there were leaders uh, that found themselves in a wilderness experience. Uh, David, a man after God's own heart, uh, he cried out, my God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? Uh, he cried out, good God, day to die, day and night. Uh, Jeremiah, who was called the weeping prophet, uh, even said, for these things I weep. Uh, Elijah, he hid in a cave saying, God, just take my life. Uh, Peter, he threw his hands in the air saying, you know what? You guys can do what you want to do, but I'm going to just go fishing. Now, please understand that when we find ourselves going through the wildernesses of life, we are forced to take one or two directions. Uh, uh, we, we can get disappointed with God for not helping and protecting us. We can lose faith or question whether God still has power to do what he said he can do. Uh, or the second thing is we can keep on praying uh, and drawing strength and comfort from him. The question is where our faith and strength lies in is in the Holy Spirit. It reminds me, it reminds me of a story, Deacon Hubbard, it reminds me of a story that there was a daughter that complained about the hardships in her life. Her father, a chef, took her to the kitchen. He filled three pots with water and placed each on high fire. Soon the pots came to a boil. Uh, in one, he placed carrots. In the second, he placed eggs. In the last, he placed ground coffee beans. He let them sit and he let them boil without saying a word. And the daughter waited, wondering uh, what he was doing. And after 20 minutes, he turned all the burners off. He finished the carrots. Uh, he, he fished the carrots out and placed them in a bowl. He pulled the egg out and placed them in a bowl. He scooped the coffee out and placed it in a bowl. And he turned to his daughter. He asked her, he said to her, what do you see? Uh, she said, I see carrots, and I see eggs, and I see coffee. The father further explained, look carefully, they all changed. That each of them had to face the same adversity. They, had, they all had to face boiling water, but each of them reacted differently. Uh, the carrot went in strong and hard, but came out soft and became weak. 
The egg had become fragile, just a thin outer shell. But after sitting through the boiling water, uh, its insides became hardened. The coffee bean uh, were unique, however, after they were in the boiling water, they had changed the water. Uh, he asked his daughter, he asked his daughter, which of these are you? Uh, that when the adversity knocks on your door, how do you respond? Are you a carrot? Are you an egg? Are you a bean? Uh, and some of us, we would be like a carrot, previously strong, but when adversity and hardship hits us, we will lose our strength and become weak. Uh, we begin to lose our faith in God. Some of us will be like the egg, pre previously gentle and meek, but after the hardship, we are hardened and bitter against God. Uh, or some of us will be like the coffee bean. The hot water did not change us, uh, but we changed the hot water. The very thing that brings pain, we changed the taste of the water. We gave out an aroma that transforms the environment. And the fact remains that too many of God's people like to complain. Uh, we especially like to complain in order to make the problems of life someone else's his fault. Uh, we say it's too hot. Uh, we too cold. It's too fast. It's too slow. It's too expensive. It's too uh, cheap. It's too dry. It's too wet. I'm not being treated right. Life is not fair. Did you hear what they said to me? I can't believe how I was treated. Please understand that complaining is basic to the human nature, but it's also the product of faith and crisis. Uh, and so, in other words, when you find yourself in the midst of adversity, you ought to be like the coffee. Uh, you ought not to allow your adversity to change you you, uh, but you ought to speak to every adversity in your life uh, and you ought to tell it it has to line up with the word of God. Uh, who am I talking to here that got some power uh, that can speak to every condition that you're going through uh, and tell your condition it has to line up with the word of God. Uh, I don't care what the doctor said about my healing. Uh, it got to line up with the word of God uh, because the word of God said by his stripes I am healed. Uh, I don't care what the bank said about my money. Uh, it got to line up with the word of God uh, that thou shalt supply all of my needs uh, according to his riches and glory. Uh, I don't care if my children turn from God. Uh, it got to line up with the word of God uh, when I begin to speak it. Uh, oh, is there anybody in the building uh, that says every time I speak, uh, what I speak has to line up with the word of God uh, because the last time I check, uh, the Bible says uh, that there is life in death. Uh, I feel like preaching on a Wednesday night uh, in the power of your tongue. Uh, somebody ought to look at your neighbor uh, and tell your neighbor you're more anointed uh, than you think you are. Uh, I know folks told you you wasn't anointed. Uh, folks told you you would never recover from what you've been through. Uh, but somebody ought to touch your own self tonight uh, and say I'm an anointed somebody. Uh, I've been chosen by God. Uh, I've been set apart for such a time as this. Uh, and so I learned how to have power huh? to walk into circumstances huh? and speak those things which aren't huh? as though there were somebody shout I got power there it is there it is tonight I'm almost done tonight here it is here it is we are prone to complain when we feel most insecure uh, when we do not need to trust God feel that we don't need to trust God in the midst of what we're in. And here it is, can faith, the question is, really help you overcome our drive to complain? How quickly we forget, how quickly we move on from security to insecurity. How quickly we move from confidence to worry. How easy we equate God's available means to provide for us to the limited scope of what we can see, predict, and recognize. How quickly we limit God to the range of our own possibilities. How quick we, we pick God in this little box. Not understanding God is so big uh, that God, amen, outweighs anything uh, or any problems that we have. And look at the psalmist. The psalmist admits to it. He says, he says in essence, I complain. And as we read through the text, it almost appears as though Asaph is about to lose it. 
Uh, is there anybody here that ever been to that place uh, where you felt like you were about to just lose it? Uh, maybe if you lose it for a minute or two, you will feel a little better. Uh, anybody ever been at your breaking point in life? Uh, nobody better say a word to you. Uh, don't even look at me the wrong way. Uh, because if you do, I'm about to lose it. Uh, but notice what happens in our text. Notice Asa, he uses this term, I will. Somebody shout, I will. He uses this term, I will, three times. In verse 11, he says, I will remember the works of the Lord. Uh, he says, I will remember the wonders of old. He says, I will meditate on all of your works. When we read the first nine verses for a moment, we thought that he is going to lose all hope. But then we get to verse 10, and it turns all around. He refuses to focus on his situation. He refuses to continue to complain because he knows God has not changed. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, God has not changed. Oh yeah, we change. Our circumstances change. But God will not change. Matter of fact, the Bible declares that he is the same God yesterday. He is the same God today. And if he wakes us up tomorrow, he's going to be the same God. That God called out to Adam in the garden of Eden. Uh, in Genesis 3, 9, Adam, he says, where are you? Uh, not, 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 he didn't say, where did I leave you? Uh, and he said, where are you? Uh, in other words, God did not move, but Adam moved his position. Uh, Y'all missed that tonight. Yeah. He, 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 he says, Adam, where are you? Uh, and here is what I really like about this passage. The psalmist did not have all the answers to his problem. Uh, he did not know how long the hardship would last. Uh, and God, uh, he did not ask God for a timetable or a time frame. Uh, he did not wait until he saw the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, uh, yet this he knew, that God had delivered his people before. Uh, and that God is still able to do it again. Uh, because what he has done in the past reveals God's heart for his people. Uh, is there anybody here that understand that God love never change? Uh, that God loves us, amen, in spite of us. Uh, that the breakthrough is not in our complaining, uh, but the breakthrough is in our praise. Uh, and so after the psalmist found himself complaining, he realized that he had to make a turn in order for God to bless him. Uh, the turn he made was away from complaining to a spirit of praise. Uh, he now begins to praise God for the specific things that he has done for Israel. Uh, and contrast to this part with the first part of the psalm, the first part describes his struggle. He was in the midst of pain. He was self-centered. Uh, and at this point, not once did he refer himself to his circumstances. Uh, he focused, his focus was on God entirely. Uh, he talks about God's holiness. Uh, he talks about God's power. He talks about God's salvation. He talks about God's faithfulness. He talks about God's mercy. Uh, and in the midst of our complaining and complaints, uh, it is essential for us to understand that we have to turn this thing around. Uh, we must meditate on God and his works. Uh, we ought to think about what he has already done in our life. Uh, it is at this point that God will begin to deliver us from those issues and situations uh, that challenges us to complain. Uh, and it may not happen overnight. Uh, it may be a process that we got to go through. Uh, but look at the last word in verse 3. Uh, that word, say lie. This means uh, that the psalmist uh, probably did not write this psalms in one setting. Uh, that we understand the word say lie to mean that every now and then we ought to take a silence. Uh, we ought to pause or a chorus. Uh, this tells me that we have to move to a point uh, where we take our eyes off ourselves uh, and we have a time of reflection uh, and a time of pause uh, and a time of thinking about the goodness of God uh, and where God has brought us from. Uh, and when we begin to take our time out of ourselves uh, and take our mind 
minds off ourselves uh, and take our minds off our circumstances uh, and start focusing on the goodness of God. Uh, what we do is we move from a place of complaining uh, to a place of praise and thanksgiving. Uh, and you got to understand on tonight uh, that praise is a weapon uh, against the forces of evil. Uh, praise is what keeps us from complaining. Uh, praise is what tells the devil uh, it does not matter what I've been through in my life. Uh, that when I look back over my life uh, and when I begin to think about where God has brought me from, uh, my praise says uh, that I may be down now, uh, but if I keep on giving God the praise uh, sooner or later uh, he'll turn it around for me. Uh, is there anybody in here uh, that understand that you have a weapon called praise uh, that will move you from a place of complaining uh, to a place of thanksgiving. Uh, praise will make you look at somebody else's condition uh, and look at what somebody else going through uh, and turn around and open your mouth uh, and say unto God, it could have been me uh, outdoors. Uh, it could have been me uh, on the sick bed. Uh, it could have been me uh, almost about to lose my mind. Uh, but because I've learned uh, how to keep my praise uh, in the midst of what I was going through, uh, my praise began to transcend me uh, from a place of complaining uh, to a place of thanksgiving. Uh, so every time I would complain, uh, I start thinking about the blessings of God. Uh, and all of a sudden, my hands are lift up. Uh, and I got to tell God that. Uh, when I would complain uh, I turn around and praise God uh, because I look at somebody else's situation uh, and I realize that it could have been me uh, in the midst of it all. Uh, when I would complain uh, I start to think about God uh, and where he has brought me from uh, and so when I praise God uh, it is a weapon to tell the enemy uh, that you can no longer help me captive uh, to what I've been through uh, and I realize what the Bible says uh, that who the son has set free uh, shall be free indeed uh, and I wonder am I talking to anybody here tonight uh, that learned how to train your complaining uh, into a praise to God uh, is there anybody here that had the testimony uh, that every time I felt like complaining uh, I began to think about where God has brought me from uh, what he has lifted me out of uh, what he has saved me from uh, what he has redeemed me from uh, and I start to give God the praise uh, and I understand every now and then uh, there are people that are around me uh, that can't understand the praise uh, that God has put on my spirit uh, but if somebody in here look at your neighbor uh, and tell him if you knew my story uh, you'll understand why I got a praise uh, if you knew what I've been through, uh, you'll understand why I gotta lift him up. Uh, if you knew the hell and high water uh, that the Lord has brought me from, uh, you'll understand why I can't remain silent uh, because what a God has done for me. Uh, and so you must understand uh, that when you move to a place uh, of praise and stop complaining, uh, you must understand uh, that God will begin to revive you uh, and he will begin to restore you uh, and he'll put back in you uh, everything that has been taken out of you uh, because complaining uh, will weaken our spirit. Uh, it will affect our prayer life. Uh, it affects our church life. Uh, it affects our relationships with one another. Uh, it affects our teaching. Uh, it affects our complete uh, preaching. Uh, somebody ought to open your mouth uh, and say, excuse me, uh, I just complained. Uh, but I thank God uh, that he moved me uh, from complaining uh, to praise. Uh, he moved me uh, from a spirit of heaviness uh, to praise. Uh, come 
Isaiah. Uh, for Isaiah says uh, that I'll give you uh, the garment of praise uh, for the spirit of heaviness. Uh, is there anybody here uh, that's grateful tonight uh, that he takes one thing off of you uh, and he'll put something greater on you? Uh, and that's the reason I can show up uh, with a spirit of thanksgiving. Uh, that's the reason I can sit down at the table uh, and when I have fellowship with family and friends, uh, I can give God thanks uh, because there's somebody else uh, that don't have a meal on their table. Uh, there's somebody else uh, that don't have a roof over their head. Uh, there's somebody else uh, that don't have a job to go through uh, on Monday morning. Uh, so somebody ought to look at your neighbor uh, and say, I got so much uh, to give God thanks for. Uh, I got so much uh, to praise him for. Uh, and as one preacher said, uh, as I take my seat, uh, if you need 10 reasons uh, why to thank God, uh, the first reason is uh, he woke you up this morning. Uh, the second reason is uh, he woke you up this morning. Uh, the third reason is uh, he woke you up this morning. Uh, the fourth reason is uh, he he woke you up this morning. Uh, the fifth reason is uh, he woke you up this morning. Uh, the sixth reason is uh, he woke you up this morning. Uh, the seventh reason is uh, he woke you up this morning. Uh, the eighth reason is uh, he woke you up this morning. Uh, the ninth reason is he woke you up this morning. Uh, and the tenth reason is uh, he woke me up this morning, uh, he started me uh, on my way. Uh, say yes, say yes, uh, say yes. Let's go. What go? My brother, my sister, you better jump on board. Where I am now is way too small. 